On mountains of Mecca, what can you tell of the day that stones from the sky fell? Destroying an army determined to break the house of Allah that Abraham built. We need to ask ourselves, why is that land today called Saudi Arabia? Why is it named after a family? Ask ourselves, let's ask ourselves, <coughs> Ibrahim salam did not call that land Ibrahimi Arabia. He did not even name it after his son who was settled there, Ismail salam to call it Ismaili Arabia. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa did not name that place as Muhammadi Arabia. So how can we accept one family of thieves to call that place Saudi Arabia? Why is that holy land named after a family? If that family is so pious, I asked you, brothers and sisters, why is it that their sons and daughters are going around in the nightclubs of Europe? Why are they so disrespectful of Allah's best place on earth? The place that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has declared a place of peace and security for people. If you have been following the news, they had their security guards wearing masks and black clothes, carrying guns in that sacred territory. Right there, the Prophet ﷺ would go unarmed into Makkah. Even Umar anhu, who was a very, very strict ruler of the Muslims, he would never ever carry any weapons in, in, the, in, the, in the area of, of, that is referred to as the Haram of Makkah. Even if he had to punish somebody, he would take them outside the boundaries of Makkah because that place has been designated a place of peace and security by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are other things that we really, I am really very, very concerned about. And that is, when you and I go for Hajj, and I urge all of you please to keep this in mind, unless it's absolutely necessary, please don't go more than once for Hajj. Not because I don't want you to get the baraka. But if you want to follow the sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa he performed only one hajj in his life. And we have people who have made a habit of going to hajj every year, they call themselves al-hajj and whatever. And you ask, has any change come about in your character or in your life? If not, then you are wasting your time going for hajj. But leave that aside. When you go for hajj, would you rather like to see the house where the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lived? Or would you rather see a Hilton hotel erected over there? Would you rather see the house where Khadija radiallahu anha lived with her beloved husband, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Or would you rather see Starbucks or McDonald's or Kentucky Fried Chicken? My brothers and sisters, this is what is happening to our sacred place. And I ask you, you know, I'm sure those of you have been to Rome or Athens or these other places or England, you go to Rome, they have the Colosseum of their forefathers, they, they, the, the Romans, Colosseum over there. You go to Athens, the Greek monuments are all over there preserved. Millions of people come as tourists to look at them. You go to England, where I studied many years ago, there's a place called Stonehenge. It's a very, according to the British, I mean the British do all kinds of eccentric things and this is one of them. There are just a few stones, are they big stones? That's one of their great historical monuments. Just a few stones. No particular significance. But you go to Mecca and Medina, today you can't find the house where the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lived. You can't find the house where Khadija Radiallahu Anha spent her life with the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You can't find the house where Abu Bakr Siddiq used to live. There, they set up Hilton hotels and banks and Kentucky Fried Chicken and other things, even Starbucks. And then they accuse us of being mushriks and doing bid'ah when Muslims go to the Jannah al-Baqi to pray for the Sahaba and the family of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And they say you are participating in shirk and you are doing bid'ah. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to go to Jannah al-Baqi. There are many examples from his blessed life. And when you see Starbucks, those of you who see, who are familiar with these things, you know the symbol of Starbucks is the, the face of a woman with flowing hair. That hits you right when you come out of the haram in Makkah. 
This is the kind of shirk and bidah that these people are perpetrating over there. And you know what they are doing now? Because millions of Muslims, when they go for Hajj, they want to go and climb the Jabal An-Nur to get to the cave of Hira. You know now, the people that are, that are in control of the Hira they want to demolish that entire mountain because they say that these Muslims that go and they want to go to the cave of Hira where the Nabi Sallallahu received his first revelation. And they say this is bidah. So brothers, please, let's sit down with some scholars, those who are real scholars, not these scholars for dollars. Let's sit down with real scholars and find out whether it is bid'a or not. And what gives you the right to destroy the monuments of Islam? You know, in 50 years time, if let's say they have blown that mountain away, the house of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doesn't exist, the house of Khadija Radiallahu doesn't exist, 90% of the historical places of Islam have been destroyed over there. 50 or 100 years down the line, somebody, some nightmare can get up and say, there was no Islam, there was no Zubillah, there was no Prophet. If you say he was, where was he born? Where did he receive the revelation? Why are we allowing these kinds of things to happen? Who gave them the right to inherit that thing, to destroy that place? If they say, okay, we need to provide accommodation, there are ways to do so. You don't have to destroy those places, you can put up people a little further away. I think we can do a, a survey in the Muslim Ummah, and I am 100% certain that the overwhelming majority of Muslims would say, preserve the historical places of Islam, we want to link with Islam. I mean, wouldn't you want to go and see the cave of Hira and offer Turaqat Nafur, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his first revelations to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa They want to deprive us of the right to link up with prophetic history. They want to deprive us of understanding how the revelations came. But who gave them this right? And why are we silent about this? Again, I bring you back to the example of Ibrahim He took nothing for granted. Even when he was made the Imam of the Ummah by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of the entire mankind, he still wants to ask about his own project. Today, you go and see the constitution of the monarchy in the, in the Arabian Peninsula, they say when the king dies, his brother in line is going to take over. And they also say that their constitution is based on the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet I have, with my limited knowledge and understanding, I've studied the Quran, I've studied the Hadith of the Prophet I've not found a single ayat in the Quran or a single Hadith anywhere in the Sahih, Sita, or any of the Hadith things in which Islam permits kingship or it permits inheritance from the father or the one brother to the next or from father to the son. There is no such thing in Islam. And yet we have allowed our most sacred place on the face of this earth to be desecrated like that. And you know, millions of people go for Hajj every year. They even pray in the Haram of Makkah, they pray to Allah to help us, uh, to help our brothers and sisters in Palestine and these other places. You know why Allah doesn't answer our prayers? When Ibrahim salam and Ismail al only two of them were there, they prayed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered each and every one of their prayers. So obviously there is something missing in us that was present in them. And what is that? They meant what they said, they were committed to Allah, they were not hypocrites, they were not munafiks. Astaghfirullah. But we unfortunately, the majority of us, we indulge in, in nifaq, we indulge in hypocrisy, we don't mean what we say, we simply verbalize things. <laughs> Why should Allah help us if we are not helping our, uh, our leader, supporting the cause of Allah? You know in the Quran it also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us very clearly in Surah al tawbah that only those people are permitted to handle the affairs of uh, Makkah and Medina who fear Allah. Walam yaksha illallah. That's the, that's, those are the words of the Quran. That those who fear Allah, ask yourselves, are the present people administering Makkah and Medina the kind of people who only fear Allah? I have my very, very serious doubt. If you know what is happening in the world, I'm sure you would agree with me. So my brothers and sisters, on this eve, let us make a commitment that we want to preserve the heritage of Makkah and Medina to be left intact, not to be destroyed. Because that is where we link up with prophetic history. 
If you build modern buildings, I mean, you know, monstrosities, you can build them anywhere, but Makkah and Medina shouldn't be turned into New York or Las Vegas. There are many, plenty of places to go and enjoy yourself. I think their purity should be preserved. That is our duty and our obligation. So in this E, the message that I want to deliver to you is make sure that you become aware of the reality, that you join other brothers and sisters who want to preserve those historical monuments. You know, in this country, in Edmonton, the first mosque was built in 1938. Only 70 years ago. More than a few, a few years, more 74, 73 years ago. The Canadian government dedicated that mosque because the Muslims are going to expand the mosque. That simple, humble house that was built in Edmonton, which was a mosque, it has been taken up from there, complete, intact, and put on top of a mountain in Edmonton, preserved as a heritage, heritage site. These people who are non-Muslims, they have more respect for our heritage. And those people who call themselves Muslims, they don't have any respect for our Islamic history and prophetic history. Isn't that a shame? Shouldn't we be concerned about these things? Shouldn't we pay attention to these things? Or do we simply want to enjoy ourselves and close our eyes to the reality that we don't care? We can't do anything about it. Of course we can. But we need to become aware of the reality first. So I hope and pray, inshallah, that you will pay attention to this aspect. أقول قولي هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله والله أكبر الله أكبر Alhamdulillah, my brother, you are right. What we want to do, if you really want to do something, please give us your name and your contact details because there are Muslims in the world who have launched a campaign to preserve the historical sites of Islam. Some of them, unfortunately, have ended up in jail in the Arabian Peninsula in Makkah and Medina. But we need to link up with them. We need to lobby on their behalf. Even, you know, UNESCO has lobbied the government of the, the Arabian Peninsula to not destroy those historical sites. UNESCO has done that. SubhanAllah. Isn't it amazing that, you know, non-Muslims understand and appreciate the value of historical sites and those people within the Muslim world, they call themselves Muslims and they are not really concerned about these things. So, those of you brothers and sisters, if you are really concerned and interested, please Give us your contact details and we will inshallah mobilize the Ummah of Islam. And it can work. Believe me, like you know, in uh, 30 years ago, uh, up to 30 years ago, they used to slaughter these animals during, during uh, Hajj and they would just dump them in the ditches and, and bury them. And then Muslims got together and said, this is Israf, this is waste of precious meat when there are millions of Muslims starving around the world. And that meat was then preserved and now if you have been to Hajj recently, the meat is not wasted. There are uh, uh, refrigerators and other big storage facilities. If you can't utilize your meat, they take that meat and they pack it, clean it, package it, and then they send it to our Muslim brothers and sisters around the world. Isn't it a tragedy when you look just across the Red Sea in, in, in Somalia, millions of our brothers and sisters are starving, millions. And yet, we see this kind of Israf over there. My appeal to all of you is, please, when you go for Hajj, let us avoid these five-star Hajjis. It's unbecoming Muslims. When you have Muslims who are starving over there, just across the Red Sea. Aren't the Somalis our brothers and sisters? Aren't we responsible for them? Can't we, can't we make some sacrifice for their you know, livelihood, for their children? Can't we give them a helping hand? I think we should do that. We should be concerned about these things. There are many things that we can do. But first and foremost, let us get together. Give me, a, give us your content details. And we'll allow you to take care of it. Oh, mountains of Mecca, how will it feel when the earth shall quake and tremble with fear, and we shall be gathered together to stand in the court of Allah with our deeds at hand? Oh, how we pray.